Welcome everyone uh, to the first institute colloquium of this year, organized by the Faculty Association of uh, IIT Madras. This is indeed an uh, exciting time of the year in the campus. You know, we have cultural and arts event happening right now on campus, which is just following the science and technology event. And it's only befitting that we have uh, Professor L. Mahadevan from Harvard University, who treads uh, between these two worlds with his unique insights. Uh, Today, he's going to be talking to us about uh, folds, cuts, and isometries, art, science, and technology. I'll just give a brief overview of uh, Professor Mahadevan's work and his academic trajectory, and, and then we'll get started with the talk. So Professor Mahadevan did his uh, undergraduate studies from this campus, IIT Madras, and he finished it in 1986, followed by a master's and PhD from Stanford uh, in 1995. He was a faculty in MIT from 96 to 2000, and then he was a faculty for a brief bit in University of Cambridge from 2001 to 2003. In 2003, he moved to Harvard University, and he's been there since then. And he's affiliated to the, he's affiliated to the biology, physics, and engineering schools over there. He has received several awards during his time out there, and I'll just list down a few really important ones. Um, He's a recipient of uh, the MacArthur Fellowship in 2009. For those of you who haven't heard of MacArthur Fellowship, it's also dubbed the Genius Grant. It's given to uh, uh, people for the creativity in arts, humanities, and sciences. Uh, interestingly enough, he was also awarded Distinguished Alumni Award in the same year, in 2009, of uh, IIT Madras. Uh, he was elected as the Fellow of the Royal Society in 2016, and most recently, he has been elected as a member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. As someone who has worked with him, I know his rapacious curiosity to know everything about everything. And this has actually led to some fundamental contributions in uh, the fields of biophysics, geometry and mechanics, embodied intelligence, and mathematical physics underlying art forms such as origami and kirigami and musical instruments such as uh, musical saws and steel pan drums. Today he's going to share a sliver of his thoughts and it's uh, an honor to have him here in our campus. Uh, looking forward to your talk, Professor Maha. And I'd like to thank the Faculty Association and the Alumni and Corporate Relations Office for their help with the arrangements. Thank you. Thank you. Can people hear me? Yes, come everybody. Thank you so much, Kanga, for the very kind and generous introduction. And thank you for those who came here instead of enjoying the outside uh, arts. Um, I hope to entertain you in a slightly different perspective, from a different slightly, uh, perspective, but associated with questions which perhaps all of you at some point or the other in your lives have um, thought about and maybe played as well. If you remember your high school anthropology, or history course, um, you might remember that anthropologists typically um, define different eras of human culture in terms of the ability of humans to master uh, and manipulate forms of matter. Okay, so you have the lithic ages or the stone ages associated with the ability to try and manipulate stones, make tools. Um, you have the metal ages associated with the ability initially to manipulate bronze, uh, then iron, uh, copper, and so on and so forth. And so you have the metal and bronze ages. But if you dig a little deeper into your textbooks uh, on anthropology, you will find that there is a parallel culture. And there's a parallel culture associated with the ability to manipulate soft forms of matter, skin, fibers, and their biological, or oh, sorry, uh, uh, mechanical, physical mimics uh, which would be paper and cloth, uh, things that humans invented very early on as they tried to manipulate matter. And if you think a little more about this, you'll recognize that, in fact, there is a strong dichotomy uh, associated with the ability to manipulate matter using brawn, so large forces and high powers, and brain, uh, which is associated with just using geometry and topology and playing with these very, very delicate forms of matter which required not a whole lot of strength, but a lot of imagination. And of course, artists and artisans have essentially been doing that ever since. And so what I want to do today is to try and walk you through a journey which started out in the arts and the artisanal crafts, but I think in the 21st century is becoming more and more scientific. And why did it take so long 
perhaps because it was very hard, not because it was very easy. Uh, so if I can get my screen to move, I will, and it's not responding. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. So as I was saying, a um, few thousand years ago, we learned, or our ancestors learned, how to essentially manipulate very brittle materials by napping and chipping, um, so large forces. A few thousand years later, we learned how to use high power densities, uh, increased temperature. By increasing temperature, Instead of playing with the shape by breaking it, we played with shape by essentially changing the phase of matter. We essentially switched from a solid to a liquid. Uh, in that liquid phase, it was very easy to manipulate the matter, and then we cooled it. And then when we cooled it, we were essentially able to create complex structures. So this is high forces, large forces, large powers. Okay? But simultaneously, or a little after, people also recognized how to essentially shape material by instead of using temperature, they used liquid water. So you use clay and water, and by using clay and water, you were able to change the phase of matter. You essentially switched from a solid to something which was kind of solid, more like a liquid. You then formed it, and then after you formed it, you dried it. So this is a much, much more different, very different perspective. Although, if you think about it from the point of view of materials and material technology and physics, um, uh, in the end, you're doing the same thing. You're using different means. In one case, you're using liquid. In another case, you're using power. And still later, we started using um, artificial analogs of uh, skin and hair uh, by creating fibers. Uh, fibers essentially starting with cotton and then with silk and a whole bunch of other things. And then it started becoming even more interesting because you could now control topology, so the connectivity of the material, and the geometry, so essentially changing lengths and angles. And by playing with these, we could start controlling, again, uh, uh, matter by ma controlling shape. And why did we want to control shape? Because as soon as you can control shape, you can essentially start controlling function. Structure automatically almost always constrains and simultaneously enables function. And so if you want to control structure, you've got to figure out how to control structure. We started out here, we went this direction, and simultaneously we also started thinking about these things. But remarkably, until the Industrial Revolution, or well into the Industrial Revolution, we didn't really move so much away from these, and we completely forgot about these because they were essentially the realm of artists and artisans. What I want to do, as I said before today, is to essentially tell you about one little aspect of how humans have been able to use geometry and topology to control matter in the context of something that everybody over here plays with. Uh, I don't know for how long, we'll still be working with paper, but everybody knows that paper is remarkable material. Um, it's biologically inspired. Uh, in fact, it's biological because it comes from wood. Um, and by controlling the composition of paper, by controlling the humidity, by controlling, and I'm going to show you deformations in the paper, you can essentially create almost any shape. And at some point or the other, I think everybody over here, I hope, has had an experience with origami and its unheralded cousin, kirigami, that I will introduce to you. So that's where I want to be. That's why I want to try and take you on a, a journey through over the next 45 to 50 minutes. And I want to tell you about a few different ways in which we all have experience of manipulating paper. And I want to then unpack that from a scientific point of view, from a perspective of mathematics and physics, and eventually moving towards uh, technology. <clears throat> so these are images constructed by a graduate student who worked with me a few years ago, Levi Dute, of origami structure. So origami, as I'm sure you all know, is essentially associated with taking a flat sheet of paper and essentially creasing it. And as you can crease it, when you crease it, you can create shapes that you couldn't have imagined are possible with a sheet of paper. For example, you can take a sheet of paper, and I simply am going to be unable to drape it onto the surface of my head. I can bend it in one direction, but it's going to be effectively impossible to bend it in an orthogonal direction associated with a strong constraint, which is the paper can't stretch. And there's a very deep theorem associated with the fact that a sheet of paper cannot be essentially used to cover the globe or the surface of my head, which goes back, in fact, already to Gauss. And yet, 
even though you can't do the smooth sheet of paper, as soon as I introduce these strong deformations, I can do this. And these deformations control the configurational degrees of freedom, and by controlling the configurational geometric degrees of freedom, you're able to essentially do things which you didn't think were possible. Artists have known this forever. Scientists and mathematicians are only now beginning to be able to do it, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Instead of playing with the configurational degrees of freedom, which are geometric, so controlling angles, you can essentially control connectivity. You can take a piece of paper and you can cut it. Now, if I'm rather brutal, I can just take a piece of paper and if I cut it, I can just cut it into two. But if I'm a little more subtle, then what I can do is I can take a sheet of paper and I can cut it, not completely, incompletely. So the cuts essentially meet at certain points, but not completely. And so when the cuts meet, there are still vertices and the sheet of paper can essentially be articulated about these hinges. And if you can do that, then perhaps you can essentially take a flat sheet of paper, for example, this square, cut it, and you pull on it, and when you pull on it, the whole thing opens up, and I can take the square and make an egg, or an Easter egg shape. So over here, instead of playing with the geometry, you're not playing with creases, you're essentially playing with the topology, because I'm essentially changing the connectivity of the piece of paper. I'm changing the number of cuts. <clears throat> In one case, I'm changing the orientation, the location, uh, and the number of creases. In the other case, I'm doing the same thing, but with cuts. One is more geometrical, the other one is topological. Instead of thinking about the configurational degrees of freedom, which there are only two topological and geometric ways of essentially controlling these sheets of paper, assuming that I'm not changing length, I can then say, ah, I'm going to change length, and I'm going to change angle. So I can take a piece of paper, and if I wet it, then the piece of paper can essentially become deformable. I can stretch it. If you have a piece of paper, for example, associated with something that you were reading uh, in uh, the kitchen or in the bathroom, and if it becomes wet, you know that it will deform. Okay? So it swells and it deforms. So instead of using the configurational degrees of freedom, you can essentially use what I'm going to call the accretive degrees of freedom. I'm adding material. I'm adding water. I'm taking away water. I'm drying or wetting it. And for example, I'll talk about this as well. I can take a, a flat sheet of paper um, and carefully uh, cut the paper up into very small strips and then push the paper with some clay through a syringe, create a two-dimensional printed structure, which when I essentially subject it to humidity, I can use it to, for example, mimic a flower. Uh, in this case, um, a lily. Or maybe if I'm even more sophisticated and ambitious, uh, I can convert, for example, a sheet of paper into a face. How do I do that? How can we do that? Okay. <clears throat> All these problems start out very humbly. They are essentially inspired by what artists and artisans have done. Um, the hope is that using a little bit of mathematics, relatively simple mathematics uh, and physics, uh, we can essentially start creating mechanisms, ways of of, of controlling shape by playing with the configurational degrees of freedom and or the accretive degrees of freedom. Okay. So I want to now, having framed the question, I want to think about it slightly more broadly. How do we control shape? How have we controlled shape? How, has, how do engineers, uh, how do scientists think about controlling shape? You can also ask a question, how do you measure shape? I'll come to that at the end if uh, anybody's interested. There's a very much more uh, difficult question, which is how do we interpret shape? I mean, you're looking at me, you hopefully will recognize me uh, a, a few minutes after the talk, uh, maybe even a year after the talk. What are you recognizing? What are you essentially thinking about when you think about shape? So there is an aspect of shape which is associated with neuroscience and cognition. There's an aspect of shape which is associated with mathematics and physics, uh, which is what I'm going to focus on for today. Okay? If I wanted to control shape, a continuous approach is associated with taking a material and then playing with the properties of the material. Um, for example, I can take glass, I can take steel, I can take wood, I can take paper, and I can essentially change uh, 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 that material and use that to control shape. <clears throat> or I can keep the material exactly the same and I can change its structure. So I can think about the way in which the material plus the structure gives rise to complex emergent properties by controlling the topology, controlling the geometry. For example, I can construct mechanical metamaterials. Perhaps all of you have heard about optical metamaterials, materials which, for example, have the possibility of cloaking an object, uh, materials which have the ability to, for example, create perfect mirrors. Uh, but in fact, there are much more humble mechanical analogs of metamaterials. My favorite example is a sheet of paper which has been crumpled. Okay? So I take a sheet of paper and I crumple it, which is, in fact, the result of almost everything I've ever done. It's always a failure, so I have to crumple the sheet of paper and throw it away. Um, so this paper, this piece of crumpled paper actually has an interesting emergent property, and I'll come back to this again and again. And here is its emergent property. If I take an object, such as a piece of rubber, and I stretch it in one direction, it will contract in the other direction. 
yeah? Because I preserve volume, so if I pull it in one direction, volume conservation would say if I'm changing this dimension, the other dimensions have to shrink. This paper is not now just a thin sheet, it's a crumpled piece of paper, but look what happens if I pull on it. If I pull on it, it doesn't rip, it actually expands in all directions. So it's got this emergent property of having what is called a negative Poisson ratio, it's what's called an oxetic material, where if I pull in one direction, it actually expands in the other direction. And it's purely because of its geometry that you essentially have this property. The flat, thin sheet of paper doesn't have this on its own. So here is an example of a mechanical metamaterial, which can be very, very easily made, and yet you might not have predicted it unless you thought about it a little bit. But once you've thought about it, very, just a small amount, you can essentially see this. And so the goal that I'm interested in is inspired by these mechanical materials. Can we control the topology and the geometry, and or therefore the structure, and ask how to essentially control shape? That's the continuous perspective. <clears throat> if I'm thinking about thin sheets, which is what I want to focus on, because as I said, my inspiration is a simple sheet of paper, I want to remind you of a few things, which I think almost everybody over here at some point or the other has seen, and also almost certainly experienced as well. Any thin sheet, which means a two-dimensional object sitting in three dimensions, um, thin in the context of saying that I have a dimension, the thickness dimension, which is small compared to the other one. Uh, it's very easy to bend a thin sheet, but very, very difficult to essentially stretch it. Uh, everybody has this experience. And mathematically, that corresponds to saying, or physically, that corresponds to saying that there is an energy associated with deforming the sheet of paper, which has two contributions to it. One contribution associated with changing lengths and angles in the plane, and another contribution associated with changing how it's embedded in the third dimension. And these two contributions scale very differently. The energetic scales very uh, differently with respect to the thickness. One is proportional to just the first power of the thickness, the in-plane stretching contribution, and the other which is proportional to the third power of the thickness. And that means as the thickness goes to zero, this energy goes to zero, which means it's very easy to deform. Very simple idea, which um, I presume all of you have seen at some point or the other. More sophisticated ways, this is associated with the embedding, what's called the uh, uh, metric tensor, and this is associated with the second fundamental form, and I'll come back to that. So as the thickness goes to zero, this is a mode which is very, very expensive. This is a mode which is very easy, and therefore I can take a thin sheet and bend it very easily. So it's very stiff to stretch, very soft to flex. And a consequence of that is that if I take the sheet of paper, then I can very easily crease it, okay? but I can't stretch it at all. Very, very difficult to stretch. And origamists, um, the artists uh, working in origami, um, ori from um, uh, a, a fold and gami from uh, a paper, have recognized this forever. So you can essentially create creases. And once you can create creases, now you can do complicated things. What can you do? You can, for example, create a paper crane. How many of you have not made a paper crane in the last five years? 10 years, okay. Uh, how many of you, how, okay, so I presume that, I'm not sure I asked the question properly, but never mind. Most of you have had some experience with this. Okay, so here is a paper crane, and how, what are the instructions for a paper crane? Here are the instructions for a paper crane, but not complete. Why are they not complete? Because you're not told which fold to start with, what is the order of folds, and if I'm not going to tell you the order of the folds, it's a very hard problem. And I'll come back to this, okay? I'll come back to this. It'll come back and haunt us. Even if I give you the pattern of the folds, if I don't tell you the temporal order, it's a very difficult problem. And there are some very beautiful analogies to problems in computer science associated with this. But at least this is part of the solution. It's not the complete solution. And what do you see over here? You see that you have the ability to change the orientation of the potential creases, the number of creases, the location of the creases. Okay, so you have a large number of degrees of freedom. How many creases? Where are the creases? And how are they oriented? <clears throat> what is the building block? You see over here, and this is not the only possibility, but I'll limit myself to this for reasons again, which I will indicate in a little while, that at every vertex, you have four creases which come together. So every one of these vertices are four creased objects. And um, please uh, uh, remember this because I will come back to this. There is a very beautiful consequence of that. That's the origami. If I was thinking about kirigami, kirigami has cuts instead of folds. There's a very nice duality mathematically, which again, we will come back to. And when I have cuts, for example, I take this set of squares, I glue them together as I've shown over here, 
at edges, four edges coming together, you can see that I can rotate each one of these squares. And by rotating each one of the squares, I don't change any lengths of the interior of these gray squares, but I open and close the spaces in between. And by opening and closing the spaces in between, I can essentially deploy the structure in the plane. And in principle, I can also deploy it out of the plane. So I can control shape by controlling the creases over here, and I can control shape by controlling the edges over here. And what is the building block? The building block is a hinge where you have four edges coming together. OK? So if I give you a set of creases or a set of cuts, I can ask a number of questions, for example. Oh, and one very important thing. I said this, but I want to write it out, which will come back to us. Um, I'm not deforming the sheet at all anywhere except along the cuts or along the creases. Everywhere else, I'm preserving all lengths and all angles. So mathematically, I am basically remaining as close as, I'm possible, as it's possible to being a flat sheet, which means the metric everywhere is the metric associated with a flat sheet. Mathematically, gij, the fundamental first fundamental form, is just delta ij, uh, the, the metric associated with the Euclidean flat plane. So all the damage that's done is done along a set of measure zero corresponding to cuts in kirigami and creases in origami. Creases and the locations where the creases meet. OK. That is a continuous approach. Uh, sorry, that's, I'm sorry, that is a discrete approach, uh, what I'm telling you over here, as opposed to the continuous approach. And in this discrete approach, I mentioned this before, you can control the number of creases or cuts. You can control the coordination. I'm going to preserve the coordination for most of the talk. At the end, I'll tell you a little bit about how you can control the coordination as well. You can control the size of the creases or the cuts. You can control the orientation of the creases and cuts. You can control the location of the creases and cuts. And with these five fields, which are functions of space, uh, we can ask a number of questions. We can ask, for example, questions associated with what mathematically we will call the forward problem. And the forward problem is you give me this structure or this crane, and please tell me how, if I pull on it, will the object respond? What are the mechanical properties? What are the electrical properties? What are the chemical properties? If I basically am thinking about this, not just in terms of sheet of paper, but a sheet of an electrical material, for example, where I want to use as an antenna or something of that sort. I today will not tell you anything about the forward problem. And the reason I won't tell you anything about the forward problem is because I was inspired by, I tried to convince you that you should also be inspired by the problem associated with what artists and artisans have done, which is the inverse problem. And they have this remarkable imagination where they say, ah, I imagine a crane, I imagine a dragon. How in the world should I take a piece of paper and introduce folds at the right places and then give instructions, not just to, to myself, but to you so that you can create your own dragon or your own crane. So the inverse problem is far, far more interesting than the forward problem. And which is why I want to focus on that today. In particular, how do I design these different fields? How do I design the number, the coordination, the size, the orientation, and the location of creases or cuts in order for me to be able to take a flat sheet and convert it to a dragon, convert it to a hat, convert it to a set of you know, expensive clothes or whatever? So that's the framework. That's the question. And I want to start with origami. And I'll walk through some examples in origami. And then I'll tell you about kirigami very quickly. Because once you understood how to do this in origami, if I have understood how to essentially characterize the mathematical constraints, then we can essentially turn the crank in kirigami as well. <clears throat> so how do we start? Where do we start? Okay. Um, this is where the title of the presentation comes in. I want to focus on isometries. So as the word indicates, uh, uh, keeping measures, metric, uh, the same. So I want to keep the metric as much as possible, exactly the same as that of a flat sheet of paper, which means I keep all angles and lengths the same, piecewise flat, the metric gij is delta ij, except along the edges, and of course where the edges meet, the edges meet at vertices, except at these two sets of measures zero. And those are the only possibilities, right? Because if I have a two-dimensional object, I can either have in this two-dimensional object, I can have curves or straight lines, and I can have points. And so I've essentially controlled everywhere I've forced the metric to be the two-dimensional metric uh, associated with Euclidean geometry, except along the edges and the vertices. And then, what are the degrees of freedom that I'm allowing you? The degrees of freedom are associated with rotations. Why do I think about ro these as rotations? Because if I have a facet here and I have a facet there, the only degree of freedom that I have left is a rotation. 
If I have a curved object, it's more curved crease, it's a little more complicated. If I, a, if I have a straight crease, I have rotations. But these rotations are three-dimensional rotations because depending on where I have the creases, I essentially am rotating things uh, in different directions. And it's a very difficult, I want to try and convince you, it's a very difficult problem in general to try and coordinate all the rotations because I'm not allowed to tear the piece of paper. Okay? So we'll come back to that as well. And you can decide a priori whether you want to prescribe the topology, whether you want to prescribe the coordination of the creases or the cuts, or whether you want to prescribe the geometry, or you want to prescribe neither. Okay? For the most part, I'm going to prescribe the topology, so I'm going to use four coordinated vertices, and I'm going to control the geometry. How do I essentially move these creases around so that I can essentially solve this problem? Eventually, I'll tell you about how to do the second. We don't really have a way of how to essentially combine them. Very, very hard problem in, in, in mathematics. Okay, where do we start? <clears throat> so here is a good place to start, which essentially embodies many of these constraints. Uh, and this very natural form is inspired by what, for me, was inspired by what I've, you've seen in biology. Um, so I want to actually walk you through that. Um, so this is the inside of a gut uh, of a, a chick. Uh, it's also what would have been part of the pattern in your gut when you were in your mother's womb. And you can see these zigzag patterns, same zigzag pattern you see when I essentially have a piece of uh, uh, gel which is drying. And as it dries, it shrinks. And as it shrinks, it forms these zigzag patterns. You see the same thing in some sets of classes of leaves. Uh, and you can even understand it. Uh, mathematically, and I actually have an example and demonstration of that. So this is this object over here. Okay, so similarly, everybody can see this object is essentially a set, uh, a flat sheet which has these creases which are uh, at some angle relative to each other, and this object has the same properties that I told you that the crumpled sheet of paper has. Namely, if I pull on it in one, uh, in in two directions which are parallel to each other, then the whole sheet expands. Most materials will not do that. Most materials, if I pull in uh, uh, along a direction, they will contract orthogonal to it. So this already has these. This, this, this object has very interesting um, properties purely because of its geometry. Again, come back to that in a minute. Uh, um, this particular class of folds uh, was invented or supposedly invented. I say supposedly invented because nature had figured this out a few hundred million years ago. Uh, Japanese uh, astronomer and engineer, uh, Koryo Mura, uh, basically came up with this design. It's a very clever design in order to resolve the following problem. Uh, I think all the young people over here don't know what maps are. I actually do remember uh, uh, what maps are. Um, um, what are maps? Well, maps are essentially a way to compress information that's spatial onto a piece of paper, which you can fold and put in your pocket or uh, somewhere in your car dashboard. Um, and it's very easy to open a map. You just keep opening it so that the area increases. Uh, it's very difficult to close a map because you have many possibilities. Every fold has two possibilities. If you have n folds, you have two to the n possibilities. So it's an extremely frustrating experience to fold a map. Um, and the remarkable thing is that you have two to the n possibilities for folding uh, a map only if the folds are orthogonal to each other. If the folds are not orthogonal to each other, all the folds couple immediately. And so it's a testament to the tremendous stupidity uh, of humans that it took until Mura uh, to figure out that all you had to do is essentially have the folds non-orthogonal to each other, and all the folds will couple. And therefore, the problem of essentially folding and unfolding goes away because you essentially can unfold or fold the entire map in one motion. Okay, go figure. Anyway, for those of you who, who know about maps, uh, that's great. If you don't know about maps, forget about it. Just a cool, cool fact. What are we trying to do? So these objects that I'm showing you over here, as I hope you can see visually, uh, are essentially just generalizations of this. The same folded pattern you see in the gut, you see in leaves, you see in drying gels, um, you can even compute. <clears throat> what do you want to try and do? What do you want to try and do is go from this nice periodic structure into some complicated shape. For example, can I essentially take a sheet of paper and can I wrap it around a torus, wrap it around a donut? Um, uh, that would be a dream. We can't quite do that yet. I will, again, tell you a little bit about where we are. Uh, but I don't want to end up over here, okay? because that's a disaster. That's, as I, as I said, the result of a, a, a failed experiment. Uh, how do we control the orientation, the location, the number, and the position of the folds so that I can take this periodic structure and then deform that in order to create a hat or a dress and whatnot? Mathematically, 
there's a very beautiful theory going back to the work of John Nash uh, and Misha Gromov associated with what's called convex integration theory, which begins to address these questions in a particular limit. And I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to essentially tell you more uh, uh, about this idea. But in a nutshell, what Nash and Gromov recognized is as soon as I give up degrees of continuity, continuity of the second derivative, um, I can start accommodating very, very complicated shapes in terms of sheets of paper where I have folds and hierarchies of folds, folds within folds and so on. In our case, we're looking at the hierarchy which is very simple. I have just one layer of folds, not folds within folds. And that in that one layer of folds, I can control the location, orientation, and number. What can we do with them? Okay, what is the unit cell? The unit cell is this object over here. Uh, four plaquettes connected together, and these four plaquettes can be folded. And again, I'm gonna make a demonstration for you of that. With this, with this object, um, so the fundamental unit cell is this. Because it was an earlier fold, it was hard for me. Uh, so I have a single vertex. At that single vertex, I have one, two, three, four um, edges coming together. And this object can open and close. And what I'm interested in doing is taking this building block and then connecting it to all kinds of building blocks in the neighborhood and asking how should I essentially take all these building blocks, glue them together, respecting the constraints associated with the fact that I've constructed it out of a sheet of paper so that I can deform it into a hat, a dress, a solar panel, an antenna, whatever you want. So that's the dream. That's the goal. That's the question. Okay. So I now take this whole set of unit cells uh, corresponding to what perhaps is equivalent to the hydrogen atom. Oh, I should point out that this has a single degree of freedom. It's exactly one internal degree of freedom, which you can visualize over here. And if I do a count, it's exactly one degree of freedom <clears throat> because I have these four plaquettes. Uh, they each sit in three dimensions. Uh, and therefore, I have four, one for each one of them, multiplied by three degrees of freedom for each plaquette. I have constraints. What are the constraints? The constraints are these edge constraints because they're glued to each other. There are four of these edge constraints. Each one of these edge constraints kills two degrees of freedom. The only degree of freedom which is left is associated with a fold. So I've killed eight of these degrees of freedom by gluing these four rhombi to each other. And then finally, I kill all three degrees of freedom associated with the fact that this sits in three dimensions. And so I have three rotational degrees of freedom uh, in three dimensions. And so what's left over is one degree of freedom. And that one degree of freedom is this internal degree of freedom. That's why I chose, that's why we chose four coordinated vertices. Once I have four coordinated vertices and I connect any number of them, I will still have exactly one global degree of freedom, which is wonderful because that with that one global degree of freedom, I can open a map and I can close a map in one shot. It's very, very, very nice to be able to do that. What are we going to dream? What are we dreaming about? What we're dreaming about is to now ask whether we can give up this condition of nice periodicity, but still preserve these properties. Why? Because then I can make it of a flat sheet of paper, so I can essentially try to mimic an artist. What are the properties? The properties are that it's developable, which means that it's piecewise flat everywhere except at edges and vertices. It's what's called flat foldable, because I have two states, both of which are flat. This is open and flat. I've completely folded it. It's also flat, so it's flat foldable. So I can fold it, put it in my pocket, and walk away. It's also rigid foldable. Rigid foldable now is associated with the process. Flat foldable simply tells you that the end state and the beginning state are flat. Rigid foldable says that now I have an infinite one parameter family of deformation, which essentially takes me from the beginning to the end. Um, a single degree of freedom. I told you that this is very unlike a, the usual kind of map where I have two to the n degrees of freedom. And it has negative Poisson ratio. So if I pull in one direction, it expands in all directions. And we'd like to preserve these properties in green, give up the property in red, because periodicity is understood, very easy, break periodicity, but by breaking periodicity, then I can essentially deform it, as I said, to make a piece of art. For example, a dragon or a crane, right? Okay, so here is now my mathematical question. Given the coordination, four-fold vertices, design their geometry, which means the size, the location, and the orientation to achieve any shape, and, preserve these properties that I told you about, developability, which means I don't have to stretch or, or tear the paper anywhere, flat foldability, so I can just flat, uh, collapse it, put it in my pocket, and walk away, 
rigid foldability so that I have a one parameter family connecting them. And finally, the whole thing is just one global degree of freedom. That's what we'd like to do. Okay, so how do we frame, this is now in words, how do we frame this mathematically and pictorially? So my pictorial representation of the question is this is my unit cell, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight copies of the unit cell. I'm going to assume that the blue nodes are free. The red nodes are fixed to whatever shape I want. The red nodes, I, for example, shape, fixed to the shape of my head. And I ask, how do I move the blue nodes and preserve these properties? Okay, so that's the optimization question. So that I have, instead of the simple deformation, I have a more complicated deformation. Well, all I have to do is now convert these words into equations. I won't write the equations down, but I think everybody over here can write the equations down once I tell, me, tell you exactly what each one of these means. What are the constraints? So the constraints are first, because I'm not tearing it, at every vertex, the sum of the angles must be two pi. Easy enough. Easy enough to write, very hard to compute with, because the sum of the angles being two pi is a nonlinear constraint. Okay, question. Ah, yes, because I was thinking about a single uh, um, unit cell. As soon as I have multiple unit cells, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to preserve the coordination. Therefore, each one of the vertices essentially is connected to four edges. But I'm going to allow you to move the edges. Now, I say, how do you move the edges? I can't move the edges arbitrarily because I have to preserve these properties. Okay, so I preserve the topology. I control the geometry. I won't, unfortunately, have time to tell you about preserving the geometry and changing the topology. And finally, we want to essentially not preserve the geometry or the topology, the full freedom that every artist who's ever done origami does. We don't know. We're not there yet. OK? Um, all right. So some of the angles must be 2 pi. Easy enough. Every, ver every one of these uh, facets must be flat. OK? So that means the volume of the parallelopiped that I can construct with 1, 2, 3, 4 vertices must be 0 because all of them must be flat. Another nonlinear constraint, okay? Because the volume is a uh, scalar triple product. I'm sure you all remember this. So. What else, what are the other constraints? So these are the simple constraints. Volume is equal to zero. Sum of the angles equal to two pi. There's a nonlinear, non-trivial constraint, sorry, also nonlinear, non-trivial constraint, and I want to demonstrate that for you. There's a third constraint, which every origami artist knows. It's very beautiful. And the constraint is the following. I think you can all see. So you see that this fold, uh, there is an angle between this edge over here and this edge over here, okay? This visible angle over here. This angle can be written as the difference between this angle at the back and the interior angle, okay? It can be written as the difference between this angle, sorry, and this angle. But it can also be written as the difference between that angle and that angle, okay? So now, if I write that out explicitly, you find a second very non-trivial constraint, which means that the sum of the opposite angles, alpha 1 plus alpha 3, must be equal to alpha 2 plus alpha 4. And because the sum of both of all four of these is 2 pi, alpha 1 plus alpha 3 is equal to alpha 2 plus alpha 4 is equal to pi. And this is the condition of flat foldability, because I've been able to flat fold it. Okay, and this condition is known to origami artists. It's also known to geometers. Riemannian geometry associated with trying to ask how we can essentially embed uh, complex surfaces in lower dimensions. Uh, in this case, a two-dimensional two surface sitting in three dimensions and flattening it out onto, uh, uh, in, on, onto the Euclidean plane. And this condition, all these conditions must be true at every vertex. And I have to now satisfy this. It's a very nasty optimization question. Okay? What is the optimization question? Determine the free vertices. Determine the, how to fix the, how to move the blue nodes in order to satisfy these conditions. How do I know that I'm already getting the shape that I want? Because the red nodes are attached to the shape that I'm interested in. So move the blue nodes in order to satisfy these conditions, which mathematically written over here, so that I can take a flat sheet and deform it on the shape of my head, for example. Okay, so <clears throat> I can minimize some measure of the distance of the vertices. So I can use the Hausdorff distance, or I can use the Euclidean distance, it doesn't matter, subject to the planarity constraint, which is this one, developable constraint, uh, and the flat foldability constraint. It turns out that the flat foldability constraint is the hardest one to satisfy. You can't satisfy all these conditions exactly. Um, there's a theorem. I'm not going to get into that, uh, but you can satisfy them approximately. So you can now are reduced to a numerical search. And the numerical search is 
approximate flat foldability. Uh, and the idea of the theorem is the following. The idea of the theorem is if I go from this facet to that facet, I rotate. If I go from here to here, I rotate again. If I go from here to here, I rotate again. And when I come back, I have got an identity, which means that the product of rotations as I go around any loop must be always the identity matrix. And that should be true for any loop of any kind anywhere. That's a very, very hard constraint. Okay? It's a topological obstruction for the construction of origami. And you cannot, in general, satisfy that exactly. If you can satisfy that for any non-trivial shape, the theorem says, I have an entire degree, entire one-parameter family of solutions going from the original flat sheet to the current sheet all the way to flat foldability. In general, it's very difficult. So we have to do it uh, numerically in general. We can do something analytically. I'll just show it to you, and we can prove a theorem. I'll simply show you the result. So here is a construction. You give me an arbitrary curve in the plane any curve in the plane, and I can show you how to essentially construct a discrete approximation to that arbitrary curve, which will allow me with arbitrary accuracy to come close to that curve and also collapse in the third dimension, as you can see over here. So that's a constructive, that's a theorem. The construction is literally by a whole bunch of reflections, and you can make these reflections more and more refined, and as the size of these facets becomes smaller and smaller, you can get higher and higher accuracy. Okay? So that's in, in, for a two-dimensional shape. In three dimensions, you can't do this, but you can get approximations. You can construct uh, um, uh, uh, folded patterns to approximate a sphere. A sphere is different from a flat sheet because it has what's called positive Gauss curvature, uh, like the surface of our Earth or the surface of your heads. You can construct something which looks like a potato, uh, wafer, uh, a hyperbolic surface, negative Gauss curvature. You can combine positive and zero. So this is part over here is cylindrical. This part over here is spherical. This is zero and positive. This is zero, and this part over here at the top and the bottom looks like a saddle. So zero and negative. And over here you have negative and positive. And once you've got zero, positive, negative, zero, positive, zero, negative, and positive, negative, you now have the ability to be a tailor because you can do anything. You can just connect now all these different pieces together, and by connecting them together, you can make more and more complicated surface. If you have a good guess, the hardest thing in this business, because of these nonlinear constraints, uh, uh, and solving these nonlinear optimization problems, is to have a good initial guess. And it's not an accident that, except for this one, these are all axisymmetric, because for axisymmetric surfaces, we have reasonable, easy ways to guess. So Levi Dute essentially computed these using an off the shelf. Uh, nonlinear optimization program in MATLAB. I think it's called FMinCon. Um, and then he, he took a couple of weeks after the problem had been formulated, and he took a couple of months, and he created these physical instantiations. Each one of these is an actual experiment, a computation, where you can construct analogs of these things. So that's nice. Now I come to this problem that I told you before. It's nice to show you the end result, but it's not at all obvious for me to describe to you how you got there. Where did you start? How did you essentially introduce the folds? Hold that thought. I'm going to come back to this. OK, so that's first part of the problem. OK, you can also think about by stability and so on. I don't want to tell you too much about it. You can think about accuracy. If I increase the number of folds uh, and reduce the size of the folds, you can become more and more accurate. So over here, this is a coarse approximation, what's uh, called a hyperboloid of revolution, slightly more refined, even more refined where you can't even see the folds. And now here is the big but. Okay? As soon as you have a large number of variables and you have these nonlinear constraints that I showed you about, global optimization is extremely difficult and you often get stuck in local minimum. So now there's a mathematical question, also a, a physical and technological question is, uh, how in the world do you essentially go around this? Now I ask you to remember what you did, for those of you who remember when you first started origami, how do you essentially inst instruct origamists how do you start creating a fold like this uh, or a complicated pattern? Where do you start? You fold creases, but where do you start them? You st typically start with the large creases, and then you go to the smaller creases. If you've already now patterned all the creases, you start typically on the boundaries. Why do you start at the boundaries? You start at the boundaries because at the boundaries, you have a lot, lot more soft, what I call soft modes, lots more degrees of freedom because on one side you have nothing, on the other side you have material. So all the soft modes are essentially sitting on the edge. You start at the edge, and you start moving inwards. 
As soon as you recognize that, you say, why should I be using this global optimization process? Why not essentially grow origami? Okay, so I have another life where we think a lot about biology. So in biology, it's very little that happens spontaneously. I don't form the whole body at once. I essentially grow the body. So if I can grow the body, can I essentially grow origami? In other words, can I start, for example, with a single square, and then I ask, how do I add squares on the boundaries, and how do I add squares to the squares on the boundaries? But now they're no longer squares, they're complicated you know, uh, uh, trapezoids and whatnot. How do I add them in order for me to be able to now approximate, again, I'm going to use the top of my head, or my neck, or my arm. Okay? So I'm going to switch my perspective. I'm going to switch my perspective by thinking about not optimization problems, but evolutionary problems. Mathematically, not elliptic problems, but hyperbolic problems. Not solving, if you want, Laplace's equation, but solving the wave equation. So I have a fundamental change in my perspective, mathematically, physically, and also technologically. You just completely switch. So can we do that? And of course, the answer is yes, because I wouldn't be asking the question. So instead of thinking about global optimization, I'm going to think about additive approaches, okay? Uh, and additive approaches to origami. And we can prove a theorem. I'll only give you an intuition for it. We can prove a theorem. We can do anything. So with global optimization, the big problem was, I don't really know whether I can have a good guess. And even if I have a good guess, I don't know whether I can essentially convert to the solution that I'm interested in. But with additive algorithms, we can ask, if I give you a starting point and I give you an ending point, can I go from the start to the end? And the answer is always yes. So there's a theorem. I'll give you an intuition for the theorem. Um, the details, please ask me later on. And here's how it goes. So let's suppose I've given you part of a surface, okay? And now I want to ask, how do I essentially grow? How much time I have under 20 minutes, correct? 10, okay, yeah, all right. So I'll talk about origami and then I'll switch to kirigami relatively quickly because it's the same ideas couched differently. So here is my um, surface. Uh, here's where I'm adding new material. And I, I have, in this case, M facets. And I wanted to go through a degree of freedom uh, count. And what I have to do is to ask you, how do I add each one of these uh, um, little uh, um, plaquettes, these rectangular or whatever shape quadrilaterals, how do I add them in order for me to approximate some shape? That's the question. Okay. So I'm just going to go through a counting argument for you. If I have m plus 1 vertices in three dimensions, I have 3m plus 3 degrees of freedom. What constraints should I have? I'm going to have exactly the same constraints that I showed you previously. For m plus 1 uh, vertices, I have m uh, facets. If I have m facets, I have m planarity constraints. Okay, each one of them has zero volume. That's a planarity constraint. I have m minus one interior um, vertices. If I have m minus one interior vertices, then each one of these, the sum of the angles must be two pi. M minus one developability constraints. I have m plus one edge lengths. M plus one edge lengths. All these m plus one edge lengths I have to prescribe, and I have two degrees of freedom associated with picking, let's say, one boundary. Two degrees of freedom associated with one angle in this direction, one angle in that direction. That's it. Okay. Let's add them up. I think even I can do that. So this is 3m plus 2. Total number of degrees is 3m plus 3. So I have exactly one flap angle. Once I've prescribed that edge, I now have one ability to prescribe a flap angle. Once I prescribe that, I can basically solve the entire problem. Everything else is now fixed for me. Okay. So what am I doing? I'm saying that instead of thinking about this global optimization problem, you give me whatever state of the, of the origami that you have and tell me I want to essentially map, map it onto some new shape. I pick one direction. I pick one flap angle. I then have an entire row that I can basically now approximate. Then I do the same thing with the next row. Then I do the same thing with the next row. And I can essentially grow my origami into any shape. Okay, so that idea can be con con converted into a theorem. The theorem essentially gives you a marching algorithm to grow any surface. Uh, there's a little demonstration of exactly what that corresponds to. And then you can essentially create an Elizabethan ruffle. You can create these remarkable telescope-like features. You can create approximately random origami, and so on. Okay? So that essentially now is a, the beginning of the end, if you want, of designing origami, because we've now solved the problem. I've essentially told you, look, I have this global optimization problem, but instead of solving the global optimization problem, I convert it into a local marching algorithm. If I can now solve the local marching algorithm problem to essentially mark, approximate any shape, I'm done. So the origami problem as far as additive origami is closed. 
I can make the approximations more and more refined. It's solved mathematically. It's not solved from the point of view of building something much, much harder. And we don't really have a way now. OK, can I now take this idea and in a way convert this to a, a Kirigami question? So I want to solve exactly the same question, but in Kirigami. And I want to remind you what Kirigami is by showing you this video, which comes from a group in Canada. Um, inspired by some very beautiful Islamic tiling patterns. So you see the tiling patterns correspond to a bunch of these uh, unit cells connected to each other. And when you pull on it, you can deploy it. And when you deploy it, all you do is rotate the individual uh, 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 subsystem. So the squares over here and the dog bone like structures. And you are essentially able to create a unit cell. And then the unit cell, when it's deployed, basically just becomes larger. OK, so it's periodic. Now, again, we want to do the same thing. Ah, I'm not interested in periodicity, but I want to use this as a star. And I want to now change the orientation of the cuts, the location of the cuts, the number of cuts. To tell me, how do I go from any planar shape to any other planar shape? And ideally, not just any planar shape, but any planar shape to three dimensions. And by the way, I should have said that for Kirigami, and I'll say that now for both Kirigami and Origami. Both these algorithms are scale independent. It will work with graphene. It will work on the scale of maybe CLT. There is nothing in it which is physics associated. It's all geometry. And I want to emphasize that because that means it's, in principle, relatively powerful. Because I've just thrown out the physics completely, and I've just focused on the geometry. OK, so how do we do this? OK, so this is my unit cell opened up. Same idea as previously. I want to violate periodicity, but I want contractibility. So I can essentially collapse and expand. I want rigid foldability, one degree of freedom. And this object is also oxetic. When I pull on it, it opens up. Okay. So the mathematics question, given the connectivity or the topology of the cuts, how should we change the geometry of the cuts, which means the size, the orientation, to achieve any two-dimensional shape or even three-dimensional shape? For example, I want to give you a new solution to the Greek problem of circling the square. Okay. How do you circle the square? Well, you can use conformal maps. I'm going to show you one which does not use conformal maps. I'm going to use Kirigami. Okay. <clears throat> so what are the constraints? So I've written them out uh, visually, or shown them visually. The angles must add up to 2 pi. The lengths A and B must be the same. And when I rotate it, of course, all these constraints must be still present. And I want to start with this periodic object, and I want to break it up and to make it non-periodic. Okay. So here are those constraints in equations. Uh, Non-trivial uh, quadratic constraint, so it's non-linear. Vertex sum of the angles also non-linear. Um, and then I want to match the boundary because I want to essentially take this original shape and convert it to a new shape. That means the boundary should go to wherever I want it to be. Okay, so the boundary matching says that, for example, if I want to circle the square, I want to take the boundaries of the square and I move all these red dots uh, to the arc of a circle over here, the yellow ones similarly over here, the blue ones and the green ones. And I want some smoothness condition. And the smoothness condition is I don't want to make the squares very elongate. I want to try and preserve the squares as much as possible so that they are a good aspect ratio. And you can keep this if you want. You don't have to keep this necessarily. This is essentially a smoothness constraint, which tells me that I want to minimize the shear and the extension, which means changing shape and changing length. Okay. How do we start with guesses? Now we have a very powerful idea from complex analysis, thanks to Riemann. Riemann, long time ago, told us about the Riemann mapping theorem. And the Riemann mapping theorem tells you that I can take any two-dimensional surface and map it onto the unit disk. He even gave us an algorithm, or rather Schwartz and Christoffel gave us algorithms associated with that. And the advantage is now we have a very good guess. So in this case, we have fantastic guesses as well. And those are conformal maps. So, and the conformal maps allow you to essentially take the simple original shape that I want into an approximation to the deployed shape. But that approximation violates every one of the constraints. And then I now satisfy the constraints by solving an optimization problem. So I won't bore you with the details. I'll show you the results. So I can convert a square into a circle. I can do that physically. I can increase the accuracy. And when I increase the accuracy, you, something very, you see something very interesting, which we haven't actually had a chance to explore carefully, which is that in the interior, in the interior, you see the boring structure. It's just a square. But as you approach the boundary, as you approach the uh, the, the, the boundary the perimeter of the circle, you see that you have lots of distortions and contortions. So you have boundary layers which develop. And very interesting question from a mathematical physics point of view is, what is the scale over which those boundary layers are persistent? What is the size 
of the uh, 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 deformation uh, 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 defor uh, associated with the deviation from square, whatnot, we haven't essentially looked at. Okay. What can you do with other tilings? Which I told you about square tilings. Now, in two dimensions, uh, there's a theorem in, in geometry which says that there are 17 members of what's called the wallpaper group. Okay. There are 17 periodic tilings of the two dimensional plane, and that's it. In three dimensions, many more. So, can I convert every one of these 17 members of the wallpaper group into Kirigami patterns? And the answer is yes. And I'll just show you images. Okay. So, you take every member of the wallpaper group and you can essentially convert it into Kirigami pattern. And you can ask, can you do this not with periodic, but with aperiodic objects? Of course, the most famous is the quasi crystal or families of quasi crystals. And again, I won't actually go into the details. Uh, I'll simply show you one realization of a Penrose tiling. And the Penrose tiling has essentially been converted into Kirigami structure. You can open and close it. Again, non-unique. There are many different ways of doing it. This is one realization. Can you do this in three dimension? Can you essentially take the two-dimensional object and deform it into the third dimension? Now, if I do it in the third dimension, you have to worry about what happens with curvature, because I've said that all the facets remain flat. And the answer is both intuitive and beautiful, which is that all the curvature goes into the holes. Because with Kirigami, what I can do is all the complicated stuff, I just put into the vacuum. So I can take a flat sheet and I cut it. And when I cut it and pull on it, all the curvature that I'm essentially interested in approximating goes into the holes and the rest of it is essentially flat. Okay? So here's what you can do. For example, if I want to approximate a saddle, I can approximate it with a bunch of flat sheets by just pulling them out of the plane. And now these hinges become three-dimensional hinges. That's the only difference. Instead of two-dimensional hinges, they become three-dimensional. I can create positive curvature, negative curvature, and I can create something, you know, which ended up on the some journal. And now you get greedy. And you say, oh, I started with something which was closed and I opened it. But can I start with something which is closed, open it, and close it again, and it doesn't close back into the same thing? Can I do that? Because that'd be even more amazing. Can I essentially have Kirigami, where I pull, 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 it keeps opening, and if I keep pulling on it, it closes again, but it closes into a different shape. Now, there's a simple answer to that, which is that the original and the final shape are just symmetry related. One is essentially symmetry related to the other one. That's not interesting. The question is, can I do more than that? Okay. Can I have two distinguished contracted states? The answer is, we can try. All you've got to do is recognize the constraints. And what are the constraints? So initially, when I pull on this, this edge and this edge must have the same length. This edge and this edge must have the same length. And theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and theta 4 must add up to 2 pi. But as I keep pulling on it, these two edges come together. These two edges come together because I'm rotating them. So now I have additional constraints. And additional constraints are these other angles, the outer angles, because I rotate them. They come inwards. And the outer edges come inwards. So I have now additional constraints. So I can write those constraints out as well. And if I write down those constraints, here they are. I have to have now a loop condition. And the loop condition is just like in origami. I have to basically make sure that every time I go around a loop, any kind of loop, products of rotations must be identity okay, for rigid deployability. You can solve that problem also. And now this is the solution to the Greek question. To convert a square to a circle, here's the solution. And if you are a bit jarred by it, keep looking at it. Uh, or maybe not. And here is a realization. Keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling. The system rotates, all the squares rotate, and when you completely different. So you have two contractible states coupled together by a deployed state. Okay? You can't you don't have to do this in two dimensions, you can do this in three dimensions. So if you do it in three dimensions, you can take a cylinder, you can pull on it, you can pull on it, when you pull on it. The cylinder has facets which essentially start moving relative to each other. And when they close, the cylinder becomes an elongated, tall version. So this may be a stent or something of that sort, which I might need sometime. I don't know. Okay. So it's literally endless. And why is this so beautiful? I think it's beautiful because artists have already shown us that it's beautiful. We're just following them. We're just following them very, very slowly. That beauty that's there in the artist's mind, perhaps, is now enhanced in the scientist's mind because not only is it possible to explain and explore what they have, uh, but also what we can do now with the ability to quantify some of this. Okay, um, I am out of time, I think. Uh, I won't tell you about growth, but I want to stop with this last 
um, slide, same problem as before. I told you that in origami, we had this problem of global optimization. And here too, we have the problem of global optimization because I have to have a good guess. Now, of course, Riemann comes to our help uh, and Riemann mapping theorem allows us to have good guesses. Suppose I say, oh, that's too much. Can I grow kirigami? Can I grow kirigami just like I can grow origami? The short answer is yes, we can do it. And again, this allows us to circumvent the problem of solutions of the global optimization problem. So now I can prove a theorem which says, I can essentially approximate any shape. That's the theorem. Any shape can be approximated using kirigami. How do we do this? I'll just show you a picture. So this is my unit cell to start with. And we play with only the spaces. We never play with the pink squares because those are fixed for us. So what we can do is control these spaces. How do we control these spaces? You give me this link, x0 and x3, and this link, x0 and x1. I have to design x2, and I have to design x2 in order for me to essentially approximate whatever shape I want. And then I can just walk in one direction, I can walk in the other direction, and as I walk in one direction, another direction, I can essentially approximate any shape I want. And that corresponds to just matrix multiplication. I won't go through this, but again, here now is a possibility. So this shape, deployed, contracted, completely different. But now doing it using additive approximations rather than uh, 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 global optimization. And you can convert a heart into, I don't know, Batman uh, uh, and what, whatever. So you can now play with all these things. Very, very strongly non-unique, lots of possibilities. And you can essentially even construct physical approximations to this, approximate, this question of circling the square. So I think I have a couple more slides, three or four more, but I have run out of time and I can hear people beckoning. So I will stop and tell you where we are. Okay, so I told you about configurational degrees of freedom, which are geometric, and configurational degrees of freedom, which are topological, both of which we can control in order to be able to understand how we can manipulate shape inspired by art. I didn't, unfortunately, have a chance to tell you about the accretive degrees of freedom. Where are we? I only solved the geometry problem. I did not touch physics. Uh, uh, the physical problem is associated with understanding how you can now also build in mechanical response, in particular stability or instability, and dynamics associated with swelling, stitching, and so on and so forth. Uh, where are we? Um, folds and cuts coupled with the strong condition of isometry allows us to start moving towards morphogramming, so the ability to control shape by playing with geometry and topology, as artists have been doing for millennia. I told you a bit about inverse origami design, controlling shape by a geometric control, both globally and locally. It's the same thing for kirigami. I'm happy to talk to people later on by flipping the question around and saying instead of preserving topology and controlling geometry, I can preserve geometry and control topology, and I can use that to control rigidity, which is a question of great interest in the context of, of, of statistical mechanics and continuum mechanics, both in origami and kirigami. Ideally, we'd like to do both. We don't have the ability to do both. We can also lift this problem into higher dimensions for fun, not for profit. Higher dimensions associated with asking, are there prismatic analogs of that? Uh, mathematical questions about impossibility theorem. I think now we have proofs that there are no impossibility theorems. You can do everything. Variable microstructure, that comes for free. Um, and I want to stop by showing you a very beautiful set of images from a very famous mathematician called William Thurston. William Thurston was a topologist, one of the great topologists of the 20th century. Um, uh, he is probably most well known today for what is called the Thurston geometrization conjecture, of which the Perelman proof for the Poincare conjecture is one tiny part. So Thurston, his last, one of his last papers in his life uh, was working with an artist in trying to ask the question of what can you do with folds and cuts? Uh, so give up this eternal dream associated with calculus of continuity and smoothness. Be wise, discretize. And once you've discretized, what can you do? Give up these old ideas that we are used to. In the 21st century, perhaps we should be Everybody talks about digital. Uh, um, so discretize, what can you do as soon as you start approaching these problems from a discrete point of view? And it seems like the limits are almost boundless. Thurston started addressing these. Um, hopefully some of you young people over here will continue that. Um, he also worked with uh, fashion de designers like Issey Miyake, uh, with uh, 
uh, uh, artisans who wanted to try and ask how you can essentially construct complex shapes with cuts and folds. And I'll stop by recognizing that all this work was possible because I've had the opportunity to work with some remarkable students um, who got their PhDs uh, on these subjects with me. Gary Choi, who's now professor of mathematics at uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Levi Dut, who's a financial trader. Si Heng Chen, who's also a trader. Lucy Lu, who's an undergraduate, who's now a graduate student with me. And Caitlin Becker, who's now a professor at MIT. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maha. We'll open up for a couple of questions because we're running, we're running out of time. Uh, two questions. Yeah, Shikna. So, um, yeah, many questions, but one question I'll ask. Um, so, when you talked about the this this marching algorithm and, and the theorem behind it, which allows you to actually define the folds in in a in, a, in, in um, an evolutionary way, uh, there's some sort of uh, I mean, I, and, and you did mention global optimization. And, but, but, but this is an alternative to global optimization. That's the important thing. The marching algorithm circumvents any global optimization issues because I don't care. I'm now doing it locally, and I just have a marching algorithm which will give me any shape that I'm interested in approximating. Okay. But they're not, they not working together. One is an alternative. Okay. Maybe I should ask you privately because... Yeah, no, I mean, in, in, in the context of global optimization, I thought, maybe I'm wrong, that uh, a version of the question is to ask if I could optimize sequentially. And, and there the answer would seem to be no. Well, I don't know what are... you mean by sequentially when it's global. With, no, no, that, that I get to the optimum by sort of optimizing sequentially some degrees of freedom, let's say. Like if I'm doing a protein folding problem, can I, can I sort of fold subs, uh, you know, so, so a subsequence. Yeah, that's and, equivalent to a marching algorithm in that I basically you know, but, ignore. But, but I believe in that case, that will not always be possible. So I think we, yeah, we, should, we should continue this offline. Uh, Ma, is the is that oxytic part, is it so fundamental? It seemed like. No. Uh, no, it's fundamental if you're thinking about it from the point of view of physics or mechanics or whatever. No, for a, for me, it was not particularly interesting. So you could design, so instead of designing shape, you could design the oxyticity if you like. And then you have to basically try and ask whether you want to maximize or minimize that, and that would be an additional constraint. We could build that in because oxyticity is, again, a geometric condition. It's not a mechanical condition, really. So you could have, for example, pause to uh, pause on. You could, uh, so yeah, there's nothing... but, but it has no bearing on this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One last question. Uh, from the perspective of biology, all organs are extraordinarily smooth and circular. Uh, from what I see here, it seems like everything starts with a curve or a bend. But uh, over there, you don't see that even if you get smaller and smaller and smaller or older and older and older in terms of evolutionary time away from us of the organism. But uh, the cells in each type of organ are differently shaped. So has anybody looked at whether that matters or is that what is creating an organ different from another organ? Does it add up at all? Or Maybe first I would probably uh, gently disagree with what you said that all organs are infinitely smooth. That's not true. Uh, you can have different degrees of smoothness. For example, your lungs essentially are not um, infinitely smooth in the sense that you have structures, you have hierarchies. So I'm not sure I understand what and where you're going with that question because, for they're, example, generally they're not sharp. They don't have sharp edges. Lungs are circular. So sharp lung. and smooth is a function on what scale you look at it. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, maybe, it's, uh, but what is the question that I I think I may have missed that you're asking? If you have a heart developing. And the earliest of organisms where there is a heart, it was not a cone or a sharp Yeah, but, I, but nothing I said has anything to do with the physical aspect. I was just simply asking a question about whether it's possible. No, does it relate? Is it relatable to the type of the cell, the shape of the cell with which it's made? 
like here the unit cell is a square for example yeah. uh, so uh, that's not true in any organism they're all uh, oblong or uh, just long for nerves and so so uh, is that does that lead to the formation of one structure different from another as a consequence of all of them coming together as a tissue so we have worked a lot of morphogenesis and I, I, unfortunately I cannot give you all the background, but I can give you a short answer and the short answer is no. Uh, that you have enough degrees of freedom when you start thinking about multicellular tissues that you can essentially generate very, very uh, large hierarchy of shapes, even with one type of cell by basically just thinking about the degrees of freedom associated with the deformation of how the cells interact with each other. So that's an even more poorly constrained problem, or equivalently, the number of possible shapes that you can get is very, very large. This, I deliberately chose to talk about origami and kirigami because it's a very tightly constrained system. The constraints are mathematically very precise, and yet you have a lot of degrees of freedom, a lot of possible shapes with even a single degree of freedom because the object itself is a single degree of freedom. I think the question that you're asking you know, in biology is, oh, if I start with a particular type of cell and I essentially now have the possibility of controlling the number of such cells, the positions of such cells, uh, the size of each one of the cells, and the shape of each one of these cells. Those are four spatial temporal fields. What can you do? And the answer is far, far more complicated than even the simple setting. So you can, even with a single type of cell by playing with keep the cell volume the same, changing its size um, uh, in one direction, changing its shape, uh, changing the number and how they're connected to each other. Um, you can get very, very vast uh, classes of shapes. And the best example of that is not the animal world. The best examples of that are all in the plant world. Uh, 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 and Goethe, you know, the famous philosopher, natural philosopher, already recognized that uh, in the mid 18th century when he said, and actually understood that the morphogenesis of shoots, the morphogenesis of leaves, the morphogenesis of flowers, uh, uh, the morphogenesis of roots can all be understood in terms of these essentially four fields which are varying in fun as functions of space and time. Uh, but but that's sort of a completely different problem altogether because this is a very strongly constrained mathematical question that's much more strongly constrained by a physical rather than take that. Yeah, like, go ahead if you want to ask one last question. Yeah. <laughs> I did. But most of the structures we know. None of them are periodic. The, the, the periodic. There's no periodic. Like that, the curve you see there, you're telling me there is no periodic. That's because they haven't essentially understood how to use their algorithm. <laughs> yeah, but everything I'm telling you over here. Uh, um, okay, so zero periodicity. Yeah, there's nothing, no two cells over here. Uh, there is a, an overall axis symmetry, but every fold over here is different from every other fold. Uh, that's true, for example, uh, on the right side as well. Uh, and if I go backwards, uh, yeah, I, I actually, when I said I break periodicity, I actually break it. Because if you didn't break it, you would just have nothing. You just have the same original structure. Yeah, that's the Correct, I know. Yeah. Yeah. That you be able to incorporate one of those geometries. Yeah. With well, the monotile, essentially, can tile only the infinite plane. What can you do with an infinite plane? Well, maybe I should ask the question. The monotile is a monotile for the tiling of an infinite plane aperiodically. I mean, it's a nice mathematical question, but it has no bearing on anything that I'm telling you about for a very simple reason, because I'm interested in a finite tiling 
and asking if I have a finite tiling, initially periodic, how do I essentially change, give up periodicity, keep the constraints associated with a flat sheet, which is isometric to R2, so GIJ is equal to delta IJ, and convert that to any other shape. The monotile is still an ideal in the sense it's only in the case of an infinite tiling of an infinite plane where there is a single tile which will give you complete aperiodicity. But that's only true in the infinite domain. And as soon as I violate constraints associated with who's talking to whom, which I have to do in Kirigami, or where the folds are, which I have to do in origami, all that is not relevant. Thank you very much, Mahan. Uh, as as, as uh, part of the organizing team, my request, uh, Professor Mahesh Panchaknula, uh, Dean Alumni and Corporate Relations, to present a small mem memento to Professor Mahadevan. This is a, a from our I campus. Yes. yes, I've studied these things. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I had known that I was going to get to that. I would have talked about leaves. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Yeah. I am the people today. I'm going to leave it.